making the best decisions you possibly can down here. So you guys notice I'm law enforcement. I can come down here and I can write tickets. I can write lots of tickets. But it doesn't change what happens out here in this park. It's actually you guys that make that difference, you know. Coming down with good ethics. You guys are a backpacking crew, so there'll be a couple things that are different. Plus, it's a super arid environment. But it's really, it's your park. Right? I'm only just down here to harass people, but it's really your park. You're the ones that make the difference. And our goal is to protect for future generations. So that means when you guys have kids, if they can come back and have the exact same experience and see it the same way, then we're succeeding at the project and you know, what we're doing. So that's really what the goal is, right? So a couple things we'll go over that are going to be probably way different than backpacking. The first of them, I know you guys are carrying the toilets around. All right, so one of the cool things is that wasn't an agency mandated thing. That, that was invented in the 70s by guides. And long before there was group size limits, we had Tex McClatchy, who used to be a huge whitewater company as well. Tex would fill DC-9s in, in Florida and fly everybody to Salt Lake, bus them all down to Green River and put them on J-Rigs, which were boats that could go through the rapids, 13 of them, and they'd go down and camp on these beaches with 220 people. And so the guides do this week after week. Well, of course, the third week camping on the same beach, what do you think they started <laughs> to find? Except for toilet paper sticking out and the beaches smelled like poop. You know, and the guides were like, this isn't working, you know? And so they kind of invented that system of hauling human waste out because they've really found it doesn't break down. It's so arid out here, and you guys are actually out here at a moist time because we're getting a little bit of monsoons, but you know, you guys are probably used to what, 80% humidity probably on average? Like today, it's gonna be 18, and we call that moist. You know, sometimes this time of the year, we're down to 4%, 5%, so uh, it just, everything dries, and so that's why it's really important to take that stuff out. Plus, you know, the other thing is there's 5,000 people that come down here and where you find a nice tent site and somebody before you decided to dig a cat hole and bury it right there, it's just sitting in that cat hole. And it's going to be a little pungent mess that you're going to have to deal with all night. So I can't stress you enough. Those toilets are a great, great use. All right. Make sure you use them. Again, uh, these guys don't want to have you guys putting weird things in toilets, just poop and toilet paper. Uh, Sometimes these guys have had to deal with, I've heard some of the stories, green foods, <laughs> oranges, you know, that stuff plugs things up. Just put that in there. The other thing that's probably a good thing to remember is pee. It's hard to separate those two things out, but if you pee in the toilet, it fills up quickly, and then you have to go to the second one. Plus, it gets heavy really quick. So if you can pee in the river, you poop in the toilet. And which brings on the next topic, what goes in the river, all right? So if you do the same thing up here on shore as, as a cat hole, if you pee up behind the bushes all the place, what happens is it dries. All the water evaporates out and it leaves like these little crystal light flavor crystals in the ground. And if everybody's peeing, 100 people pee in the same place, the next time it rains, guess what it smells like? Huge puddle of piss. So, again, a box. yeah, it's a litter box. And it's pretty <laughs> bad down here. People still do sneak. And we come down, especially in the fall when it's raining or even in the winter and it snows, it's pretty pungent in some places. You know, folks aren't peeing in the river. Just important to get down close. Sometimes, you know, these drop banks, you know, if you're gonna have to like do a five eight maneuver to get down to the water, it might be easier just to pee up above and, and get down close because it will collapse in. But other fluids that also need to go in there is toothpaste. Don't spit your toothpaste up on shore, please. Just spit it directly into the water. Dish water, you know, it's a common backpacking thing, is to dig a hole, put it in a hole, for instance. You know, I worked in Alaska, we do all kinds of stuff with sphagnum moss. Dish water goes right back into the river. It's the best place for it, provided you guys strain it, okay? So if you have orange peels and apple cores and big chunks of, of trash and lettuce and you dump that in along a sandbar, it just washes back in. And the next group that shows up, what do they see? Like last night's salad all down, they kind of feel like it's not really wilderness. So so make sure your dish water's clean, put all that water. So all your liquids you can put into the river, which goes on to fire pans. You guys know there's a fire ban right now, right? So you guys can, we still require folks to bring it mostly for emergency situations. I have seen hypothermic people down here this time of the year. So uh, you could use it for that. I'm not gonna write you a ticket if you're trying to save somebody's life or warm them up. Uh, you can use it for charcoal. Uh, and again, if you guys come back at another time, one of the things we do down here is floaters and sinkers if you are allowed to have a fire. So anything that's you know less than your wrist size, you know, arm length that fits in the fire pan. The goal is to carry all that stuff out and not leave a black mess, leave any charcoal behind to show that people were there. But if it's hot in the morning, you can have a bucket. You dump everything that's hot into the bucket. 
whatever's floating you put in your trash can and whatever sinks you put out into the main stem of the, of the river. And uh, the reason we don't put that in the eddy is if there's any fish, you're essentially putting like coal-fired uh, power plant stuff into the air, but you're putting it into the water and the fish are going to have to breathe that stuff. So keep it out in the current. So that's how we deal with that. You guys have charcoal? You do have charcoal. Mm -hmm. so. Make sure you keep a jug of water around. Uh, the fuel moisture is plummeting. You know, if, if fire starts to link up into the trees here, and you'll see there's a lot of dead stuff behind the tamarisk. It's right along the river, but we have huge river bottoms of dead tamarisk from a beetle. And I just had them landing on me. They're little green beetles with yellow stripes on them. They eat the tamarisk. And that's what's called that dead, cause that dead fuel. So the fire gets into there, it's really impressive. 200, 300 foot flame lengths, like it is really impressive. So, and then who knows how long they'll go. So, moral of the story is keep some water by your charcoal, manage that really well, please, for us. Uh, uh, da, 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 da. A couple other things to talk about. I heard Kenny talking to the advisors and the, I guess it's SPL, is that what you are? Yeah. What's the SPL stand for? Senior Patrol Leader. Okay, Senior Patrol. So I heard that discussion. So the ARC sites, I can't stress you guys enough. This is your park, explore the place, but leaning on walls that have been out for 1,300 years, really easy to destroy them. One person can do a lot of damage. You wanna look at that stuff from a distance, don't climb into them, like the Fort Bottom, there's some holes. And there are people that cr climb into them, but they're the ones that are gonna ruin that for other future generations. You wanna look at that from a distance. Even the smallest amount of leaning on certain stones that have been mudded in 1,300 years ago, you can break that mortar loose, and then that stone, other things get under it, and next thing you know, that stone falls off, and we're down to the next stone. So we are the ones that destroy that for future generations. Again, your hands, the oil in your hands breaks down the manganese. So you'll see the dark coloring on all the rock out there that's called dimanganese oxide. A lot of discussion about where that dark color comes from. Some people think it's an organic bacteria that lives in the rock surface that helps extrude the manganese that's naturally there. Some people think it's a water based thing. Those surfaces of the cliff actually get moist enough to cause it to leach out. Uh, it's probably a combination of both, but that's what that dark coloring is. And our oil breaks that down and causes it to exfoliate off. So if the Native Americans have pecked into it with a petroglyph or are drawn on it with paints, a pictograph, and you touch it, you cause that rock surface to fall off with that great writing. So again, don't touch, uh, and especially don't be carving your names. You know, and you get bored and you say, well, you know, Tony Tachi was here in 2017. <laughs> Please don't do that. There are historic inscriptions down here, and obviously petroglyphs and pictographs are historic. Those are things that we want to look at, but we don't need to know about you guys being here. So please don't, don't put that down there. Even in the smallest places, if, uh, if I was to put my name on a, a rock face and next week somebody else would think it's okay, and it's amazing how fast graffiti ruins our park. And that's one of the things we battle a lot in other places. So, uh, Arc sites, try not to camp within 300 feet of them, and that's the obvious stuff. So when you guys are trying to pick camps out here, that's what we shoot for. A lot of the stuff we talked about, I heard Ken talking about, guided, guided in the right spots. Uh, it's also the known sites. The Anasazi most likely stayed right here. 1300 years ago to 1100 years ago, but obviously, you know, this is a hardened surface, so it's what we know. Uh, uh, you, you might find some water in Water Canyon. Please don't swim in those side streams because that is actually water for all the bighorn and the, the deer population, and we don't actually have that written in the permit, it's in our compendium now. Uh, again, right now it's so dry here, the deer and the sheep have moved down into the river corridor, and sheep are very fragile water source users, I would say. Uh, they're being displaced by wild burrows and horses. So if we go up there and swim in those little side streams, they're not gonna wanna use that water. So uh, just check that stuff out from a distance. There's probably a lot of native toads that are actually a lot of tadpoles cruising around, so just check out the life in those pools. The same with Anderson Bottom. I think Kenny talked to you guys about if you need water, there's a pond. Uh, blasted pool up in a ledge up up above a uh, great place and it, I would treat everything out here I used to drink it a long time ago, but I read some EPA reports Yeah, I'd drink it not a bad idea or treat it uh, Do you guys have treatment stuff you bring? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Pumps or chemical? Both. Chemical. Okay. I have both. Yeah, generally 
that's what our water folks in the state say is, you know, it's great to pump it, but then, you know, a little bit of treatment, Clorox or some type of chemical to get the viruses that go through the filters. Uh, you could have Norwalk that's actually living in the river regularly. So it happens in the Grand Canyon periodically, uh, thanks to the Park Service, because we didn't treat our sewage very effectively in the dam, I guess. That's what caused the, <laughs> Thank two you. Big, the two big ones in Grand Canyon in the last 20 years. So, uh, other quick things to go over safety equipment. Some of this is state law, some of it's our law. But uh, five spare life jackets, there's 18 of you, so you guys need to have at least four spare life jackets. Uh, paddles, since you have nine canoes, you gotta have one for three, so you just need to have three spare paddles. Uh, I'm not sure if these guys uh, text talk about using paddles for bullards <laughs> to tie off. Not necessarily the greatest thing. That's usually one of the things when we, people lose canoes, they're like, yeah, we stuck our paddle in the sand and we tied off to it, and then the paddle pulls out and the canoe's gone the next day. Because the river does do some weird things. So uh, if it rains really hard upstream, you can see a couple foot rise in this river. So be prepared for that stuff. And then obviously dragging canoes up onto beaches and not securing them in the afternoon gusts of wind come by. I have seen Grumman canoes pitch pulling up beaches before which is pretty impressive. All right, I'll tell you that story someday. <laughs> uh, camps, you know, try to make your camp as clean as possible when you guys leave. You might find that other people have left messes. People love to put huge ballards into the ground, you know, to tie canoes off, which is like a big piece of driftwood because they think, oh, this will be nice for other people. But really what we shoot for is that sociological thought process when you guys pull into a camp it should look like wilderness like nobody's been there that's the goal and it should make you feel like wow this is a really amazing place versus if you see like a structure built out of driftwood or places to tie your canoes it lets you know if other folks have been there and that's really what we're trying to avoid so if you guys see bullards you guys can pull them out and you can always restore beaches back to a nice clean areas and we got a lot of kids that love to build sand castles and again some people will hate that you know, it just depends. If you see somebody's sandcastle, I'm not going to get mad at you for kicking it down and smoothing the beach out and making it look pristine again. Because the next people will thank you guys for that. Uh, getting a little bit lost. Uh, is everybody over 13? Yes. That's what I figured. Uh, so the main thing is, is, do you guys know where the life jackets are required? I think you guys are required well, to wear them. BSA, we're required to wear them all the time. That's right. So, but anyways, if, if uh, you guys were down here with your families below the confluence, it's required after that. So, uh, paddles, life jackets, first aid kit. What do you guys got for a first aid kit? Troopers. Got a big troop. We got a troopers aid kit. Most of us have blue. Yeah, most of us have personal ones. Yeah. 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 I'll probably just take a quick yeah. glance at it. And then, uh, what are you guys doing for patch, patch material? Is it duct tape? Duct tape. Duct tape. Yeah. Gorilla tape. Yeah, gorilla tape works great. I did a uh, cardboard boat for a boat race. And, we dominated because we used real <laughs> Talk about engineering. Where's the uh, the other engineer? I did cardboard that I laminated, glued together, and different made plywood out of it. It worked beautifully. We did it for we used it for two years actually. Uh, repeat use. That's yeah. nice. Extra credit there. Uh, the other thing, if you guys get back into canoeing, one of the things I tell folks is uh, pitchathane. It's a uh, grace water and ice shield. You put it around window frames on mm. houses. Man, that stuff sticks like crazy. And it's a pretty good waterproof patch. Uh, if it gets really hot, it gets a little gooey in the ammo cans. But uh, I'm trying to think what else I need to tell you guys about. Every boat should have a throw cushion or a throw bag. Uh, again, keep that stuff readily accessible if you need the throw bag. Obviously, if you want to have it, you don't want to have to turn around your canoe and try to stand up and dig around while you flip over. Keep somebody keep that out handy if you have that throw bag so you can help somebody out and then have you guys talked about flipping canoes at all you guys yeah. do yeah, stuff like that practice, okay. good practice day yeah i think the main thing is is just keep everybody together stay within view you guys are a big group so we want to keep you guys together again sociologically if one boat goes by every hour versus one big bolus goes by once a day people have a different opinion of that so that's why we want you to stick together plus that's safety you know you can't help the boat in the back if you're two miles downstream so together please and enjoy yourself take care of the place take was it take only uh, pictures and leave only footprints but really it's your guys' part and uh, take care of it and it'll last forever that's up to you guys cool thanks guys Thank you. Thank you. drink water too by the way
Yep.